Hello everyone and welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I know what you're thinking. Hold on a second, Cap. 5e isn't an old school game, and you're right. However, 5e is a delicious amalgam of all the editions that of Dungeons and Dragons that have come before. And in this video, I'm going to evaluate the game as a whole and give my review on its strengths and weaknesses. Then discuss what rules you can institute to emulate a bit of old school renaissance in your game. The game has been out for over two years now, and in that time, I've had the opportunity to run a campaign all the way up to 13th level with a group of experienced and novice players. So, I'd like to share the perspective I've gained. If you've been following this channel, you may have started with my reviews of editions 1 through 4, which were the first four videos I ever posted. So, consider this part 5 of that series. So, let's get started. First, let me say I think 5e is a great edition of the game, and from a certain viewpoint, it may actually be the best iteration. Much of the material from older editions is easily adapted to 5e, and in many respects, you can see tidbits of every edition sprinkled in from 1 through 4. It's rather impressive that Wizards of the Coast tweaked the game system in a way that it is both concise and elegant, but also a retro throwback, without it seeming patched and tacked on. Furthermore, unlike, say, 3rd or 4th edition, the game adds a bit of flexibility with the rules allowing for homebrewing in the vein of 1st and 2nd edition, and I'll touch more on that in a bit later in this video, but suffice to say that 5e allows a group to tailor the game to its tastes. All in all, 5e attempts to be everything to everyone, and to its credit, in many ways, it succeeds. So, let's talk about the things I like about 5e. One of the core mechanics that is new to 5e, and that is critical to its success, is the proficiency system. Since the very beginning of the game, one of the nagging issues with the system was statistic creep. In a game that is based on the role of a d20, once modifiers and advantages begin to exceed 20, die rolls become almost inconsequential. There's very little chance of failure, and with no chance of failure, things become less interesting. Consequently, very few people ever played into the higher tiers of play. The group would simply just start over with new characters. 5e addresses this issue by divesting itself somewhat with level advancement equating to statistical success. If we look at the experience chart, one can see that even by level 20, the basic success modifier is only plus 6 across all classes. The tiers of play have been carefully extended to allow for challenging play all the way up to level 20, replacing statistical improvement at various stages for neat and fun class abilities, and those are further defined by character archetypes, which I'll get to in a moment. Another neat addition to the game is advantage and disadvantage. In previous editions, a statistical advantage or disadvantage was addressed by a litany of positive and negative situational modifiers. The advantage system greatly simplifies and speeds up play by allowing the DM to simply invoke the appropriate advantage instead. If the character is doing something difficult, roll 2d20 and take the lower roll. If they are doing something that gives them a better chance of success, roll 2d20 and take the higher roll. No need to consult a chart to find the appropriate modifier. In this edition, for the first time, a role-playing background system has been added that guides a player to developing a real personality for their character, but also allows for a statistical benefit in the form of additional skill proficiencies and proficiency with certain tools. These additional skills representing a character's pre-campaign experience. In some ways, this is a neat callback to secondary skills from the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Character backgrounds detail four categories. Personality trait, ideals, bonds, and a flaw. There are several basic backgrounds given, but players and DMs are encouraged to work together to create new ones. Complementing the background system nicely is the inspiration system. 
Here, a DM can give an inspiration point to a player who roleplays elements of their background and works it into the story. Inspiration represents a redo of a d20 die roll, of an attack, a saving throw, or a skill check. An opportunity to snatch success from the jaws of failure at a critical moment. You may only have one inspiration at a time, and you don't get it back until the DM rewards you again. This is just a fun mechanic, and backgrounds and inspiration are part of the gems of what 5e offers. The experience point progression in 5e is very interesting, and in my opinion, quite clever. For those of us grognards that have been around since the beginning, the low number of experience points needed to progress to third level might seem startling at first but upon closer examination, makes perfect sense. Players don't choose an archetype for their class until third level. So what this means is that the player will have some experience with the rule system and had time to read over their character's class options well before they have to make a decision about how they want their character to progress. This is an excellent strategy for making the game accessible to new players by keeping the mechanics basic to start as well as making multi-classing into a second class early an attractive option. Looking at the character advancement chart, one can see that it's only 300 experience points to reach second level and 900 experience points to reach third. While that may not seem like a lot, it's probably going to equate to between 6 to 9 game sessions to reach third level. It's only 2700 experience points to reach fourth But then the chart puts the brakes on advancements in the mid-tier levels, extending the sweet spot of character play. Consider 3rd edition or Pathfinder that thrusts a new player into a deluge of character choices right from the start, and the reasoning becomes clear. In many ways, a 3rd level 5th edition character equates to a 1st level Pathfinder character. And that leads right into discussing the feat system, which has been greatly scaled back and made totally optional for 5e. When 3rd edition came out, I was initially enamored with feats, as I think many of us were, but over time, my thoughts on the game and the style of play I enjoy dimmed their appeal for me. Clearly, I enjoy retro-style gameplay, which translates into low fantasy. The player characters are exceptional people, but they are not superheroes in a retro-style game. If you enjoy superheroic characters, then go for it. But for me, I enjoy the challenge the low fantasy style of play represents. In 5e, feats are completely optional, and unless you're playing with a human optional rule, characters don't get their first feat until 4th level. This greatly streamlines play, simplifies the rules, but still allows for more character customization. Another highlight of 5e's creativity is the action system. Action economy in 5e is a lot of fun, and many class abilities come into play quite ingeniously with its application. Essentially, a character has three potential actions in a round, in addition to their movement. It is important to note that in 5e, a turn is very specific to the player. A turn in 5e essentially equates to a turn in a normal board game. As you progress through the queue, every player character and NPC gets a turn. And on their turn, you can take a move and an action, but you might also be able to take a bonus action and in addition a reaction on your turn or someone else's depending on the situation. When all this occurs is predicated by a variety of factors, most commonly class abilities or spells. For example, at second level, a rogue gains the cunning action ability. Essentially, a rogue can use their action as normal, but also gains a bonus action to use the hide, disengage, or dash actions in combat. The third level spell, Counterspell, has a casting time of one reaction. In this case, if you see a caster within 60 feet of you casting a spell, you can react to that by casting Counterspell and attempt to stop the casting of that spell. Furthermore, if said caster also has a Counterspell memorized, they can use their reaction to counter your counter spell. In this way, the 5e D&D system really allows for some fascinating spell-to-spell dueling combat between wizards and other spellcasters. 
However, this gets into my first issue with 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. The game is chocked full of wonderful concepts and interesting gameplay and class abilities. Unfortunately, many of the rules are poorly written, poorly explained, or just don't provide enough examples, or any examples at all, where they are needed. To compound the issue even further, questions about the rules can result in conflicting answers from Wizards of the Coast. A prime example of this is with the counter expel example above. The question has come up several times on Wizards' Sage Advice webpage, and Mike Merles has several times clarified it and said, yes, you can do that. However, when put to the same question, Chris Perkins has said no. Needless to say, this has led to some confusion, but the core issue goes back to the original writing of the rules where these concepts were introduced, sometimes discussed pages or chapters apart. There are no examples given, and the rule doesn't reference back to another related rule. The confusion in this case related to a paragraph when discussing the bonus action. It's important to note that the rules for 5e's action economy are discussed in detail in Chapter 9, but the specifics of the action economy to spell combat is introduced in Chapter 10. Under bonus action in Chapter 10, it says, A spell cast with a bonus action is especially swift. You must use a bonus action on your turn, provided you haven't already taken a bonus action this turn. You can't cast another spell during the same turn, in essence, your turn. Remember what I talk about where turns come to in the queue in 5th edition, unless it's a cantrip with a casting time of one action. Reading this, it's easy to come to the conclusion that since you were in the midst of casting a full spell during your turn, that you couldn't cast another full spell during your turn unless it's a cantrip. However, the timing here specifies a casting time of one action. The casting time for counterspell is one reaction. So, if on your turn you haven't already used your reaction, you can still cast the spell, which is the official Wizards of the Coast answer to the question. I love Chris Perkins, but he was simply wrong here, and his answer only serves to confuse an already muddled topic. The action economy of 5e is not overly complex, but it is a new concept, and to solidify how it is supposed to work in the game, there really needed to be more examples. Also in 5e, some combinations of class abilities can result in bizarre, seemingly conflicting situations that aren't clearly addressed in the rules. The most clearing of these for me is the Rage Sneak Attack. In 5e, our Barbarian Rogue can absolutely use these abilities together, though from the description of the abilities, that might not seem the case. The first sentence under Sneak Attack reads, Beginning at first level, you know how to strike subtly and exploit a foe's distraction. While the description of Rage reads, In battle, you fight with a primal ferocity. At first glance, a subtle primal ferocity seems incongruous but there is absolutely nothing in the rules to preclude the use of the character's ability in this way. As a DM, I was a bit concerned about it when one of my players multiclassed as a barbarian rogue, but it hasn't been overpowered at all. The challenge rating system in the game is just an absolute mess, so much so that I just completely ignore it. I'm not constructing an experience point budget for my encounters. I'm not jumping through multitudes of hoops to try and wrestle with a series of ambiguous concepts and calculate a creature's challenge rating. First and second edition didn't have challenge ratings, and in 5e, it's completely meaningless in my opinion. There are basically four ways to modify a creature's toughness. Increase their hit points, increase their armor class, increase their hit points and their armor class, and or add in a special ability. In this way, you can tailor encounters to your group's strengths and weaknesses. Quite frankly, Given the number of options and resources available to the players, you have to do this as a DM. Knowing their tactics, the amount of damage they can dish out in the combat round, and so on are the things you need to know to create effective encounters, not their challenge rating. I'd also like to take this opportunity to give a great big shout out and hug to Matt Colvell and his channel. 
If you haven't stumbled upon him yet, a link is in the description. But his video, using 4E to make 5E combat more fun, running the game number 31, is an absolute gem, as are most of his videos. So check him out. I provided a link in the description. Now, another example of some of the rule clumsiness in 5e can be found under the silence spell, which reads, For the duration, no sound can be created within or pass through a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point you choose within range. Any creature or object entirely inside the sphere is immune to thunder damage and creatures are deafened while entirely inside it. Casting a spell that includes a verbal component is impossible there. Seems pretty straightforward, right? It is, until you consider that from the beginning of the game, attaching a silent spell to a caster was a tried and true tactic on crippling their spell casting ability. However, in 5e, if you want to attack with a spell, the target will either get a saving throw or the caster will need to make an attack roll, neither of which is an option here. Thus, a caster could simply walk out of the area of effect on their turn and cast their spell. Invariably, a player is going to say, the point I choose is his robe, or something to that effect. This ambiguity could easily have been addressed if the wording had been more precise, such as adding in centered on a fixed point in space, or simply stating the spell couldn't be attached to a creature or character, or adding in an option for a saving throw as in previous editions. Of course, the DM is entirely free to add in their own saving throw option, which is what has been done in every edition of the game. But the point is the ambiguity of a rule, which the authors could easily have anticipated. 5e is rife with this kind of thing, and it adds a certain clumsiness to an otherwise elegant rule set. I would highly recommend that any DM download and read through the Sage Advice Compendium PDF, which will help you adjudicate your way through some of the quirky and interesting circumstances that can crop up in a game session due to these rule ambiguities. A link is in the description. Overall, 5e is a big step forward in the game. It addresses many issues that have plagued Dungeons & Dragons from the very beginning, but incorporates many of the game's best aspects from every edition, and its rule flexibility allows DMs to customize the game for their own campaigns and playstyle. Tweaking the rules has been a fun part of D&D since the very beginning as well, and 5e incorporates tweaking elegantly right into the rule set. And that brings me to the final part of this review. Tweaking the rules to emulate an old school retro fantasy style. Now, before I make my suggestions here, what I'd like to do is list the aspects of what I consider to be hallmarks of old school retro play, which to me is not so much what rule set I'm using, but a certain approach to game play. Okay, let's, here's the list. Uh, one, the characters are exceptional individuals, not superheroes. I think this aspect of play began to creep into the rules with the introduction of 3rd edition, but was really taken to its extreme with 4th edition. Characters have skills and some special abilities, but not superpowers. 2. Death is always a possibility. Characters, especially at low levels, tend to break easy. The constant lingering threat of death, one of the more stimulating aspects of old school play. 3. Resource management is a major aspect as well. Players need to consider encumbrance, food rations, healing resources, and so on. Their success and survival depends on it. 4. The challenges presented challenge the players as well as their characters. Many of the solutions to in-game problems won't be found on the character sheet. 5. Game system balance is not as important as fun. 6. Keep things reasonably simple. The 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide, Chapter 9, Dungeon Master's Workshop, has a rather hefty litany of optional rules, and I highly recommend that you check it out before delving too deeply into rules alterations of your own. The chapter offers ways to up the power level of the game or scale it back depending on the taste of the participants. For my own campaign, I've added the following rules that deviate from the standard set that I use to emulate an old-school feel and gameplay. Uh, 1. 
I use the standard array for character abilities. While it may seem old school to roll the dice, it's also old school to make characters that are capable but not superheroes. Thus, with the array, there won't be any 18s in the game at first level. This is important because in 5e, there are some nice adds for racial bonuses and further ability score customization every four levels as characters get to add a plus two to their ability scores. I also use this because I always found it annoying when you struggle to roll a high ability score of 16 in one stat. Meanwhile, the guy sitting next to you dominates the game with the three 18s he somehow managed to roll. 2. No feats. Once again, characters are exceptional, not superheroes. Having played through to 13th level, I can attest to the power that even the scaled-back feats will allow for. In the early editions of the game, the difference between the characters of the same class was almost nothing. If you ran into a 4th level fighter, you pretty much knew what he was about. What you wouldn't know is what magic items he might carry, and that's where the surprises came in. By eliminating feats, the DM has a bit more leeway to sprinkle in some interesting magic items that won't turn into devices of campaign breaking, and rules-wise, it simplifies things greatly. 3. Keep magic items to a minimum. That goes without saying, but I would recommend that you partial out items with permanent use rarely, and those bonuses should be minimal. Plus ones are great, plus twos simply an amazing find. More often than not, characters find things with limited uses or charges. Potions, scrolls, wands and rods with only a few charges left, and so on. A potion of giant strength is a great magic item, but once a character drinks it, it's out of your campaign for good. 4. Scale back the healing. As written, characters heal fully overnight. The 5e Dungeon Master's Guide offers several options to slow this down, with long rest being 7 days and a short rest being 8 hours, but I think that's a bit too much and can slow down the campaign in an undesirable way. Instead, institute the Healing Kit Dependency Rule, which means characters can expend hit dice after a short rest without a healing kit. In addition, institute Slow Natural Healing. With this option, hit points only return when a character expends hit dice. Slowing down the healing forces players to consider their supply of healing potions and moderate their boldness in regards to encounter selection. Lastly, I'd like to address one minor nit with 5th edition, and that is the tendency for Wizards of the Coast to release novel-sized campaign adventures in an absence of splat books. Granted, I think they've released some wonderful adventures, but the small, single adventure module that you just insert into an ongoing campaign is greatly missed. Though it seems that Wizards is addressing this somewhat with their upcoming release of Tales of the Yawning Portal, a compendium of classic D&D modules from previous editions going back to the beginning of the game, updated for 5e. Some of the artwork looks really great, and I'm looking forward to seeing these classic adventures reimagined with a shiny new makeover. I think Wizards of the Coast's restraint and not releasing a deluge of splat books as in previous edition is admirable, but not releasing any is also an issue in my opinion. As far as supplements go, most of what you're seeing released now is third-party editions through the SRD license. But it would be nice to see something official from Wizards. New character classes and archetypes I think are quite welcome, as well as new backgrounds, now that we are over two years into the fifth edition release of the game. To this point, in addition to third-party releases, Unearthed Arcana on Wizards' website has been the only source for new material, though Volo's Guide to Monsters was quite good and a great addition to the game. New playable races, new variations on monsters, and a reintroduction of favorite creatures not found in the 5th edition release of the Monster Manual was awesome. In the immortal words of Oliver Twist, Please, sir, I want some more. Anyway, that brings this review to a close. I hope you found it useful and informative. Have you been playing 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons? How do you like it? What house rules are you using? Please leave your comments below. And if you haven't already, subscribe for more content like this. Coming up, I have a review of the Call of Cthulhu Classic module, The Masks of Narlathotep, 
and a continuation of my Hearst Arts Crafting series. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.